I don't know about you, but Sunday morning is the highlight of my brand new spiritual week. We think about this, that Sunday morning is the first day of the week. The whole country seems to look at it as just a time for an ending, but it's really a beginning. And our worship together, our assembly together, is a highlight of that time when we come together to sing praises to God. We come together to fellowship, to talk to Him in prayer, to encourage and help one another in this journey that we call life. So it's a highlight to my spiritual week. And yet, sometimes we find this time of year especially, as spring had ended on Thursday and summer began on Friday, that we have all the summer activities, the going to the beach, the barbecues, the outdoor events, the baseball games, all the things that we get so involved in in life that we become sometimes too busy. Too busy just to stop and enjoy the moment. To stop and see the sunset. I don't know if you've been noticing the past few nights, but our sunsets have been spectacular as you watch as the sun basically sinks in the west. And the skies light up with a beautiful hue. And you know there is a God. <clears throat> How many times do we just stop and take notice of all of our surroundings? The beautiful mountains that surround us on both sides. The Olympics and the Cascades. How many times do we just stop as a family and just be thankful for one another? As we gather around a, a kitchen table or a dining room table or maybe even a card table, and just stop and thank God for what we have. Because what happens in this life is we just get so busy with things that we forget to stop and pause and enjoy the moment. You ever notice, ever notice how quickly time passes by? And the older we get, it seems to go faster, doesn't it? It does for me. And I look back at my life, and I remember when I was 20 years old, and I look in the mirror, and I think I should see a 20-year-old, and he's not there anymore. And yet I look back over the years, and I see how quickly they've gone by. And my question is, have I been too busy to really spend a lot of time with God and sharing with my family? Because I think our world just keeps going faster and faster and the world provides more and more activities and less and less time for us to just pause and thank God. Pause and realize that we are His creation and this was created for us. Stop and enjoy it every once in a while because I think sometimes we just get too busy. Sometimes the faster I go, the behinder I get. You notice that? <laughs> and so, as I think about busy lives, I think about the busy life of Jesus. Three and a half years in his ministry. You remember he went to the Jordan River and he was baptized by John the baptizer? And of course John didn't want to baptize him, but Jesus says, I, I do this to fulfill all righteousness. From that moment on when the Holy Spirit landed on his shoulder, which was a fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus began his ministry and it was three and a half years long went by so quickly. Think back three and a half years ago to your life. How much did you accomplish? Well, compared to the life of Jesus, I didn't accomplish very much at all. But Jesus accomplished wonderful things in that three and a half years of his personal ministry. His days were packed with events. His days were packed with ministry. His life was one, one event after another, and yet the, whole, the, the, uh, the Gospels only teach it just a, a little bit of a highlight of what he did. In fact, in John the 21st chapter, verse 25, John records these words. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So we just have a fingernail sketch of what he's done. 
We see him as he fulfilled prophecy. Every one of those prophecies were fulfilled that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he came to this earth to change the world for mankind so that I would have an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom, part of his family, part of his church. So when I realize just I have just a smidgen of what he did, I cannot imagine all the things that he did in those three and a half years. Just think about, about the mode of travel when he was upon the earth. I don't know any time that he rode a donkey. Well, one time his mother did as they were going to, to, to have the census taken. And then he was born, but I don't think Jesus was aware of it at the time. And he was born in a stable. But most of the time, their mode of travel was foot power, shoe leather, probably thongs or some kind of, of a slipper that would fit on their feet and they would walk from place to place. And when you look at the life of Jesus over those three and a half years, he went from Nazareth to Judea and wilderness, up around to Jerusalem, around the mountain there, and then back to Bethany. And his journeys were on foot. You ever been just walking and hiking lately in the beauty of God's surroundings? And what it does for us on foot that it does not do in a 60 mile an hour vehicle. It causes us to stop and see the beauty. To notice that moss grows on one side of the tree. And so in Boy Scouts we learned that's a way to find your way north and to find your way out of the forest. Because you know that the moss grew on the north side of the tree. All kinds of things in nature that we just whiz by every day on the freeway or on the highways. Jesus walked. And where he walked, he fulfilled his ministry. He taught. He listened. He performed miracles. And he took care of the lives of people both physically as well as spiritually. We have that same walk today. We can make a difference in people's lives if we'll just stop and listen and try to help them and minister to them. And then I think about the mode of communication. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't even have a telephone. How did they communicate? How did Jesus get his message out? What was all word of mouth? Have you heard about Jesus? When he come into the little Herodian villages, they already knew of him because they heard by the grapevine that he was someone who performed miracles and someone who changed lives. And so when he came into town, they wanted to be close to him. Remember the throngs that crowded him? Jesus was never too busy to stop and to take care of the needs of people. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? And she had an issue of blood for many years. And all she did was crawl up to the hem of his garment and touch it, and she was healed. She had that much faith. And Jesus said, who touched me? <coughs> and the disciples kind of laughed, I think. What do you mean? Look at the crowds. They're all pressing around you. But Jesus felt the power go out of himself into this woman. He was never too busy <coughs> for people. And I think that's a good lesson for us today. Not to be so busy in our world that we miss the beautiful things around us and the people that we come in contact with and the difference that we can make in their lives simply by visiting with them, having a conversation with them, maybe drinking a cup of coffee, and as a family, sharing a meal together. That's kind of a, a thing of the past in some homes where people never gather around the supper table. They never get together. Pray to God and thank Him for the food. There's some kind of a TV tray or sitting on the couch and watching something on TV that's usually not very wholesome. But if we as families would go back to, and many of us already do, gather around a table and just share a meal together. Ask each other, what's going on in your day? I see that you're kind of troubled today. Is there something that I can help you with? Just learn to listen. Jesus was never too busy to listen to other people. 
He can, went around the countryside preaching and teaching and healing and ministering physically as well as spiritually. He lived on this earth to show us the Father. That was his purpose. Not only to live and to die and to be buried and resurrected, but he came to show us the Father. You remember over in John the 14th chapter when Philip said, Jesus, just show us the Father and that will be sufficient. Listen to what he says in John 14 and verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father, abiding in me, does his works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, Father is in me, otherwise believe because of the works themselves. The days of Jesus were power packed. Every single moment he had upon the earth in his ministry was to be a shining light in a world of darkness, to show us the Father. That's the way God loves us, and yet we often think of God as some mystical being up in the sky, maybe a fatherly, a grandfatherly type person, but Jesus showed us the Father. He cared about people. He cared about his creation. Jesus wanted to show us that. On one occasion, he says, my food is not to do the will of, or my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his good work. Jesus had a purpose. We have a purpose in this life. And the purpose is that we're created in his image to be able to do good and to be obedient to him so that we can spend eternity with him. Yesterday, we had a glad home going for Les Ungren. And we knew where he was going because he had made a decision to rededicate his life and to be born into the body of Christ and the Lord added him to the church. And so we know where he is today. But what I want you to know is he has a wife and a family that still needs us to minister to them. Because Les is not there to do the things that he did before. So as a church family, we put our arms around them and, and try to support them and help them. That's what Jesus would do. And that's what he did in many ways in this life. The driving force of Jesus and the life of Jesus was to do the will of the Father. Listen to what he says in John 9 and verse 4. We must do the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world... I am the light of the world. You ever know somebody that comes into a room, when they come into the room, the room just kind of lights up. They kind of become the focal point. Well, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to a world of darkness and showed the light of the Father, showed the love of the Father. Now, he was busy. He was busy in so many areas of life that we can't even count all the things that he did. Too often people say to me today, I can't be in services. I'm just too busy. And I think that's truthfully just a lame excuse for not wanting to serve God and not wanting to do what God wants. Everything else takes priority. Oh, we're going camping. He can't be there with God today. Oh, we're going to go on the boat. Can't be there with God today. Oh, we just decided to stay home and have a barbecue. We're having the neighbors over, so we can't be in the assembly today. On and on the excuses go. And yet, if you knew Jesus was going to be here sitting beside you, where would you be? I believe you'd be right here. Because the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus is here today. And I think sometimes we just kind of go through a routine and forget what this time is all about. It's about serving one another, but it's about serving God. And Jesus sits right beside us as we sing the hymns and praise to the Father, as we realize that Jesus changes our lives and gives us the hope of eternal salvation. It's not something I do, something God's given me. We're saved by grace, the Bible says, through faith. And that faith is an active faith, a serving faith, a willing faith. Jesus always had time for other people. 
He was never too busy to pray. Many occasions in the New Testament, as you read about Christ, the Bible says he would leave his apostles and the crowd and go to the mountain to pray. He just needed that communication with God. And so do we today. When was the last time you spent more than 30 seconds or a minute in prayer? Just talking to God. Paul says we're to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I think that's a whole mindset of everything we do. God, please help me today. Help me as I drive today. Help me to be a good citizen. Help me to find people uh, who cut me off and still love them. Because Jesus said, love your enemies. Boy, that's a tall order. Sounds good in church. And we go, yeah, I love my enemies until an enemy does something to us that we don't like or that we're fearful of. Love your enemies because you love yourself. You've been obedient to Christ. Your enemy probably has not. And therefore, we have a responsibility to bring the word of God to them. Jesus always had time and made time to pray. You remember when the disciples were out and Jesus told them to get in the boat and meet them on the other side of the Sea of Galilee? And so Jesus goes to the mountain to pray and a storm begins to stir that Sea of Galilee. And they begin to be frightened. I don't know if you've ever been out in a boat. I've been out with Wayne in a boat. But I said, I think it's time to go in. The waves get pretty high. And it's a little bit scary. We don't want to sink the boat. And I think those apostles must have been the same way. And Jesus, seeing their fear, was not too busy to come walking to them on the water. They thought they'd seen a ghost. And then Peter said, no, it no, it's the Savior. It's the Master. And then Peter, being like us and impetuous, Peter says, hey, if you're willing, God, let me come to you. Or Jesus, let me come to walk to you on the water. And Jesus said, come ahead. That's all he said. He didn't make any big, long speech. Go ahead and get out of the boat. Come on. Peter begins to walk on the water. And he walks on the water as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus. When he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. Isn't that what happens in our life today? Jesus is never too busy to listen to our prayers. And our eyes need to be focused on him and the life that he lived so that we can truly make a difference for him. When he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he's talking about those that are not very likable. Maybe those who even want to put us to death because of our stand for Christ. We're to pray for them. We're to care about them. To find inroads into their lives so that we might bring the gospel of Christ to them. Jesus was never too busy to see the beauty and the creativity of his heavenly father. And so when he was ready to preach a sermon so that everybody could understand how to be happy. He chose a grassy knoll. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And they sat down and Jesus understood the beauty and drank in the beauty of that time together. Matthew 6 and verse 25 says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for the body as to what you will put on. Well, we can have that at home sometimes, can we? What can I wear? I've only got 16 dresses. I just can't figure. Oh, that doesn't happen at your house, I'm sure. Don't worry about what you've got to wear. As long as it's modest, put it on. Is your, not, is your life not more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single cubit or a single inch to his life? Why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith. Do not worry then, saying what we will eat or 
What will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Jesus never had too much to do that he couldn't tell them about worrying. How many of us worry? You don't have to raise your hand because I know we all do. I've had people tell me all week, well, I was really worried about that, or I was worried about this, or I was worried about that. God already knows what you need, and he provides for you what you need. He was not too busy to attend social events. He went to a wedding. He went to, went to several social events. As you look at the, the New Testament and the Gospels, he went to banquets. He went to a wedding feast. Was his first miracle was performed over there in John the second chapter, and they ran out of wine. And you remember the story that Jesus' mother came to him and said, "Son, they've run out of wine." And Jesus said, "What's that got to do with me?" But then he did what his mother wanted. There were six water pots there, and he said, "Go fill the water pots with water." Brought them back, and he turned the water into. He was never too busy even to take care of the physical needs of people so that they would have a time when they could share together in this wedding feast when two people are now one and beginning a new life, a new journey together. He was never too busy to talk to someone that was an outcast. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well? And Jesus was thirsty and he needed something to drink and he came to the well in Samaria, which was a taboo for all the Jews. They hated the Samaritans. And Jesus sat down by the well and said, could you give me something to drink? And there he began to tell her about her life. And he, she realized that he was a prophet from God. And not only did he provide her living water, but when he told her about the living water, what did she do? She went into town and told everybody, I found the Messiah, I found the prophet. Come out and see who he is. And that whole town began to know about the promise and the love of Jesus Christ. He was never too busy. As we go through this life, as we go one day at a time, do we have time to pray? Do we make time to pray? Do we bow our heads in worship to God. Is our life a life of praying without ceasing, always putting God in the forefront of our lives? If you're here and you're not a Christian this morning, that's the saddest thing of all. Jesus provided the way whereby you could be born again, where you could be born into his family, where you could be a part of his life throughout eternity. He come, he asks you to come confessing his name. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To repent of my sins, walking away from God and turn around and walking toward God. And then being buried with him in baptism where our sins, the Bible says, are washed away and God remembers them no more. Wouldn't that be great? It is great. And God will do that for you. That's why Jesus came and lived and died and rose again so we could be part of his family. Whatever your need is this morning, just stop and think about your life. Have I been too busy for him? And if I have, I need to repent of that and start putting him first place in my life. Whatever your need is, Jesus invites you to come while together we stand and while we sing.